Ok, hola Caro, ¿me escuchas? There it goes. Uh, va, escuchas bien.
Perfect. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for all your help over there in Ethiopia. So thanks a lot uh, for all of, of you who are joining from your houses and, uh, and inside on, in, in Ethiopia. We have a very interesting panel today, which has a very long title that I will not, uh, con not repeat. You all have the agenda. I will just um, want to point out that we're going to talk about OSIN, the Open Source Intelligent um, research tools that exist everywhere and how and, and the dilemma that they that they impose. OSINT has become a, a, a basically a buzzword today just like fake news or artificial intelligence. It 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 represents many things and hardly uh, one can one can understand exactly what it is. But we need to talk about what it is and especially the problems it can pose. OSINT is problematic, not much because of what it does, but because of what, of who uses it and for what they use it. The purpose on the use is everything in OSINT. The basic activity that, we, that is behind OSINT is what is called open source research. And this activity is legitimate. It's a legitimate tool that depends on specific contents, uh, that it is the content that allows us to measure legality. A way to approach OSINT is to think on a specific cases. And this is what I want to do today, to propose you a series of cases, to keep, pick up your brains on thinking when and why OSINT is what it has become. First, I would like to point out to some private cases. So for instance, when we seek for data to inform our decisions, think on hiring personnel. That is perfectly okay, but there are kind of uh, weird or Tricky uses, for instance, when you use OSINT to discriminate, to decide not to hire someone because of their race or their religious or their political thinking. When we look for data for public accountability on human rights abuses, for instance, that is something that Bellingcat has been doing, the, the tools of Bellingcat, they have been doing very well, very well and it is a great tool for um, civil society during, for instance, social uprisings. It doesn't like, it is not very well taken by, by many. And of course it generates some, some discussions, but it has become a, an important tool to uh, show human rights abuses. When we look for information to support advocacy projects, for instance, when you use OSINT to inform who your adversaries are, who the others are in a campaign, this is very interesting, it's important, it, it serves us all, but it, it has its boundaries. When does your activity become a profiling of the people and, and they're, they're, it can go beyond what you are looking for and, and establish a very accurate uh, profile of, of people that can affect them. But probably the cases that are more uh, problematic are those that belong to the state use of OSINT, because of course the state has a different scale, has a different relation to us as persons. Let me show you three cases. For instance, the information that a public relations company has and provides to, on, on social media interactions for a public authority. The first question would be, how far can it go? For instance, can it include profiling of political oppositions, oppositors that are being critical to this public authority? Those are questions that arise everywhere in the world. And we will have our position, of course. It, it talks about how OSINT is a great tool, but it can also, because it can, for instance, it can help that public authority to understand what questions are the people doing on social media, how to answer specific populations or things they are taking care of. But of course, it can also be a profiling. What about information research to prevent crime or threats to national security? We all want um, organizations such as FBI in the United States to look into cyber threats, shootings, attacks. For instance, what they did uh, on, on the specific cases, on very recent specific cases, that's, that's something that we believe should be done. But there are other cases such as when Colombian police investigate fake news during a national protest. And fake news meaning basically those news where they are not being shown 
nicely when they say the, their honor, their well, well name, their good name is being at, under attack. Then the situation is different. Finally, I want to propose you a sixth case. When OSINT is used to research crime, a crime that has already happened, we, we believe this is something good and, and we all want the, the authorities to have this capacity. But often these exactly same um, tools are being used and being misused to research, for instance, those who protest, calling them as terrorists or because they uh, have done calumny or, or things like that. Even in Colombia, we have heard of tools that are called to look for geopolitical intelligence monitoring. What does that mean? What are the capacities that our, our, our authorities are, are gaining? So for us, as I said in Charisma, we are, uh, I haven't told you, we are a digital rights organization from Colombia and I am the director. So when, when we speak about us in, in, in Charisma, we first of all, get in the grounds of open source intelligence. And it is a series of techniques to collect and analyze data that are hosted in open access or public information sources. This is the basic idea of OSINT, open source research. But when you talk about OSINT, there is another element, the intelligence. And then intelligence refers to the purpose of obtaining an advantage in offensive or defensive terms. But there are other elements interesting to the way we approach OSINT. It is often carried or through the use of a specialized software, and although the information is extracted from public sources, it may include data protected by the right to privacy. And here I want to say that we understand that data protection has a role on OSINT, but the main tension that we have identified is with the right to privacy. There is also another element. The fact that when we do OSINT, we're monitoring the net or are using a scrapping technique is what increases the risk on human rights. And with this introduction, allow me to continue with our panel and, uh, and, and I will let everybody introduce themselves so that they feel more comfortable with their profiles. And uh, let's start with David. Dave Mas from Electronic Frontier Foundation. Please go ahead with, our first, uh, with your first insights. Okay, so do you want me to introduce myself and talk for a little bit? Excellent. Uh, so my name is Dave Moss. I am Director of Investigations at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we are a San Francisco-based uh, uh, NGO that works on issues related to uh, digital rights and the intersection of uh, human rights, civil liberties, and technology. Um, I specifically uh, work on a team that does deep dive investigations into surveillance technology. Um, which means that I uh, both work in the field of collecting OSINT, but also analyzing how law enforcement in the United States uses OSINT and often stretches the definition of OSINT. Um, uh, part of uh, the way I work on this is we also have a partnership with the University of Nevada, Reno, a uh, university in Nevada, uh, where we teach journalism students on how to use uh, OSINT methods in their reporting. Now, what I tend to focus on at EFF is uh, uncovering uh, where and how police are using surveillance technology. So we have one project called the Atlas of Surveillance, which uh, visit if you want at atlasofsurveillance.org. I can type that in the chat real quick if people would like it. Um, uh, but this is a, a, a database and mapping project to identify which law enforcement agencies are using which surveillance technologies, be it drones or facial recognition or license plate readers uh, across the United States. And so what we do is we train students to uh, look for open source intelligence in order to build this data set. And so they might be looking through uh, news articles and press releases. They might be going through government procurement documents, so purchasing documents and receipts. They might be going through meeting minutes and agendas. And a lot of what we do is just teach them how to use advanced Google techniques, you know, just 
putting in a government website and using, you know, Google site colon government website and searching for search terms to bring up documents that may not be easily linked um, uh, in order to find out information about surveillance technology. Um, we also do it in a little bit more um, uh, direct fashion where we're not just mapping out which police departments have technologies, but like right now we're doing research on the U.S.-Mexico border and trying to identify the exact location of surveillance towers being used for border security. And by going through environmental assessments and procurement documents and even just going into Google Street View and just – you know, messing around and moving around looking for these towers, we've built a data set of more than 200 of these um, locations of uh, surveillance towers. Now, uh, one of the criticisms that we often come under from the law enforcement community or the pro-intelligence community is that you know, what you're doing is showing criminals, you know, what methods there are, uh, you know, giving criminals a, 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 a map to avoid surveillance. And that's not our goal, and that's not what we're doing, and that's not the outcome of it in the end. But it is some of the criticisms that we do have to face in doing the research. Um, and then other things that we do as well are um, using things like, um, you know, if we're tracking a specific surveillance company, digging through business records and licensing records and ownership records to really trace the various shell companies until you find out who's responsible for it. And these are traditional OSINT techniques, just going to these databases. Um, but one of the sort of complicated areas and emerging areas for people working in the OSINT sector that I'd like to point out is that we really don't know what to do with um, uh, sort of two kinds of data sets. One is data sets that have resulted from hacked data, where some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, hacker of some kind uh, has gone in and breached a system or siphoned information from a system and then put it online. And that's becoming more and more frequent. And the question is, is whether it's good or legitimate OSINT practices to go and download a data set like that and uh, peruse through it. And it's going to depend, you know, on the personal, personal ethics of your organization and the legal, you know, the legal position of your organization. But that's one of the other, the, the big things that we're looking, you know, that, that people in the space are dealing with. Um, the other is leaked information where, you know, and this has been a, an issue that people have been dealing with since, you know, the early 2000 teens with WikiLeaks and things like that. Like, what do you do when the, there's a ginormous amount of data suddenly posted online? Um, but I want to sort of, sort of switch to talk to a little bit more about the law enforcement side of things. Uh, when we first started looking at this, law enforcement sort of had this traditional view of what OSINT is like just looking at what's publicly available online. What are on people's public Facebook pages, public Twitter pages? What can you find on news websites? You know, I, you know, there was once uh, a fusion center in San Diego that was under criticism for spending thousands and thousands of dollars on t televisions. And Congress asked them, well, what are you using these televisions for? And they were like, open source intelligence. And their definition of open source intelligence was they were watching the news. And that is why they needed to spend money on this. Um, but we've noticed their, their definition gradually changing. And, you know, there's a question as especially as there becomes more security on social media, where is the boundaries for OSINT and where are the boundaries for something that should require um, a little bit of a deeper um, legal authority. So to give you an example that comes up frequently is the use of police use of fake profiles, essentially catfish profiles or sock puppet profiles, depending on what your local idiom is, uh, when, when a police officer pretends to be somebody else in order to worm their way into private Facebook groups or to start conversations with people or to see, you know, to friend people so they can see their, their photos. And is that OSINT anymore? That isn't stuff that's open on the web, but they're going to claim that because they are, you know, once they're inside, it's open on the web. 
Um, you also have things like um, the company Clearview AI, uh, which is a face recognition company that has scraped the open web, scraped uh, images of people, journalists, activists, basically everybody who's ever had an image of them posted onto the internet, whether it's from social media, a news article, or a YouTube video, and then it scraped the biometric information, the face prints of everybody, and created this enormous database for law enforcement to use face recognition to identify suspects or you know, people in general using what they would call open source, you know, images. And that kind of gets into some of the other things that we're seeing out there is, uh, you know, where it might have previously been OSINT was a police officer sitting at a computer doing research. Now you have these automated systems that are constantly scraping the internet, downloading things, using algorithms to, you know, identify social networks between people, identify people who might or might not be involved in crimes, you know, to predict where there's going to be social unrest and where people are gathering. You have these algorithms that are now combining them to create these powerful tools for law enforcement. And then the final thing I just want to mention that we're, we're seeing is law enforcement stretching the definition of OSINT to include commercial databases that they purchase access to, whether that's um, purchasing information that companies like LexisNexis or Thomson Reuters have on people, like because they're collecting information on people's finances for various uh, products, or advertising brokers who are gathering information about people's phones in order to advertise uh, to them, but law enforcement might get access to that data in order to track people uh, to find out where they were at a given time or just to find out information about their phones in general. And I would say that that is not OSINT because that is not something that is publicly available, um, but they want to stretch the definition to say that it is. And I will go ahead and wrap up there, and I'm happy to, to ring in later as we move into the conversation. Thank you, David. Um, as you see, we have a great panel. So Dave what, took his first 10 minutes and thanks a lot for, for accepting and doing both things, introducing yourself and presenting such a great landscape on, on how uh, sometimes OC can become problematic and, and has been used as a tool for what in Latin America has been even called cyber patrolling. So with this introduction, allow me to, to bring in to the panel Eduardo Bertoni. Eduardo, I will ask you again to present yourself as you best, uh, best feel and use your 10 minutes to give us an introduction or your approach to OC. Thank you very much, Caro. I hope that everybody hear me well. Um, I am Eduardo Bertoni. I am currently the representative of the Regional Office for South America of the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights. And I used to be the special rapporteur for freedom of expression at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and also the Data Protection Authority in Argentina until 2021. End of 2020, exactly. Uh, thanks for, for this invitation. What I'm going to present is part of a long working document that I did for CELE, the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression in, in Argentina. What I didn't say is that the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights is an academic institution and the headquarters are based in San Jose, Costa Rica. My office is, is, is in Montevideo, Uruguay. In the paper or in the working document that I, I, I have been uh, working, um, the first thing that I would like to uh, highlight is that the literature literature review on open source intelligence on OSINT uh, realized that it is difficult to find a date or an author who has proposed this concept. So this is a concept that has been created over the time. The other important thing that I found is that the idea of the uh, of what the concept of OSINT contained has been uh, an idea hundred of years old. And uh, this is because it is an idea referring to the collection of information available in easily accessible sources, public sources in general, in order to carry out intelligence, and I put in brackets, in, in, in quotation marks, sorry, intelligence stars. 
there was intelligence uh, during the, the, the Second World War, for example. I mean, people that were reading uh, newspapers that were all around the world. And, you know, you can see movies of people doing intelligence just uh, cutting uh, some articles in different articles that they found in different uh, media in different parts of the world and then create some sort of, 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 of analysis of that kind of, 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 of collection of data. So that, that was a synth as well. And that is considered a synth as well by the relevant literature. Those who dedicate themselves to OSINT can be both today organizations or governmental offices, as well as private sector companies or academic research centers whose researchers for the purpose of their work make use of OSINT practices. When in colloquial language, people refer to the word intelligence as an activity and not as a noun, that activity appears immediately linked to tasks carried out by state security forces in order to prevent both attacks from abroad as crime that can occur in a certain territory. Maybe this is the activities of OSINT that highlight or that put more attention and uh, concerns in international community. However, today these intelligence activities are not limited to the to the above, to this uh, concept, because the search for information in open sources incorporated uh, other actors for purely scientific or academic research purposes. Based on the possibility offered by the internet, information analysis activities with open sources have grown exponentially. But, and this is important, not just any open source data collection is OSINT. In my view, OSINT practices must be understood as an output that is reached after a process of specific collection, collection of raw data or existing information, which are the inputs, which are also later properly analyzed in order to provide information with a specific objective. And this is important to characterize OSINT. OSINT's practice is linked to the concept of open source and its relationship with the consent that the owner of the data could have granted so that these data are freely, fairly freely accessible. Despite how useful it may be to make this classification of information sources, it is necessary to bear in mind the ambiguity that exists in the scope of what can be considered as public information or private information. Since within each one at these levels, both public and private data can also be found. OSINT practice, in my view, does uh, not agree in general uh, with the protection of personal data from different perspectives. It can be a first, it can be affirmed that there is no concern, uh, consent, sorry, from the owner to process the data because the required consent form is not valid. So no consent, no possibility to process data. Or it can be argued that even though the consent is granted and the consent is valid, it can no it can in no way be applied to the fact that personal data is processed by different actors for different pro uh, purposes. So consent sometimes play a difficult uh, role there because the, the, the consent might be valid for some specific purposes, but not for all the purposes. So we have a problem there. Or finally, even circumventing the two previous issues, it can be argued that the distinction should be made between the data that exists in public or semi-public sources, because the source is not what is important, but the type of data that's it, that is treated. However, denying OSINT practices under the argument of violation of privacy or 
or, or under the argument of violation of, of data protection can be problematic in light of the exercise of another fundamental right, such as access to public information. Remember that this is information that we, ca we gather or the OSIN practice it, it means that they are gathering from open sources. So the, the question of open source and public information is an important question there. Resolving this contradiction, the contradiction between privacy, the right to privacy and the right to access information is what obliged subjects or even bodies create to guarantee access to public information uh, and what access to information uh, is. The problem is that OSINT uh, or innocent, nobody solved this contradiction and this led to the problem with a complex solution. So, I mean, this this, this is something that we need to, to work more under my field. So this leads to the conclusion that the impact on fundamental rights of OSIN practices has what we call in Spanish claroscuros, chiaroscuros, not clear. It is difficult to affirm, in my view, conclusively that these practices, OSIN practices, violate human rights in all cases. But even more complex is to affirm that this does not happen. The perspective of the analysis of sin practices from the right to privacy on the one hand and from the right of access to public information on the other hand demonstrate in my perspective the complexity of the issue that prevents us from holding clear positions regarding the impact they have and the impact they have particularly to human rights. Thank you. Thank, uh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was almost not able to unmute. Thank you very much, Eduardo. So we, we have this contrast and, and, and how Eduardo has been thinking um, the legal framework um, of OSINT and its nuances. Uh, so allow me now to introduce you to Kisinia Bakina. I'm sorry uh, for for my for my interpretation of your name. Uh, please, Kisinia, as both before, uh, please introduce yourself and, and use your 10 minutes. Thanks. Hello. Um I'm Ksenia Bakina. I'm a legal officer at Privacy International. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm thrilled to be a part of this exciting panel. Uh, in case you haven't heard of Privacy International, we are a registered charity based in London and we work at the intersection of technologies and rights. And we aim to ensure that technology is used to empower us and pretend, pr prevent governments and corporations from using this technology to exploit us. So our goal is to protect democracy, defend people's dignity, and demand accountability from institutions who breach public trust. So today I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, PI's work on um, social media intelligence, uh, which we call SOCMINT um, in the UK. So we've been aware for a long time that in the UK, uh, police and local authorities are using social media intelligence, in particularly whether it is to profile individuals and uh, to predict their behaviours or to monitor protests. And back in 2019, uh, we sent out a a freedom of information requests to uh, over 250 local authorities, as we've also received information that it's not just the police and law enforcement that are using it, but also um, governmental agencies such as local authorities. And our research demonstrated that over 60% of local authorities were using social media monitoring for areas such as uh, investigations of council tax payments, children's services, benefits, and monitoring protests and demonstrations. And this is open source kind of social media data. 
And in some instances, local authorities would go as far as making accusations of fraud and withholding urgently needed support from families who were actually living in poverty. And all of this is being done without any comprehensive guidance or internal oversight on the reliance of open source social media intelligence. So we found that there have been no quality check on effectiveness of this strategy in their decision making. And local authorities appear to adopt this approach that if your data is out in the open or social media, then it is fair game. And of course, this was done without individuals awareness or knowledge. And um, we've been very concerned because it showed that if they have no or processes in place for internal audits, then there is no there is no records being kept of how often this method was being used, whether it was actually effective, and whether it was being used in a way that is legitimate, necessary, and proportionate. In addition, in March 2021. We intervened uh, at the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Salman Bhatt versus the United Kingdom. And the case concerned the gathering and processing of uh, in Salman Bhatt's social media data by the UK Home Office Unit, um, extremism and extremism and analysis unit. Uh, and the, by obtaining information from his Facebook and his Twitter, um, he was profiled as an extremist. So in our intervention at the European Court of Human Rights, we argued that this constitutes a serious interference with the right to respect to private life, and that this goes beyond uh, individuals' expectations of how uh, their personal data on social media may be used. Uh, we believe that the use of social media intelligence by public authorities or by law enforcement agencies must be governed by a foreseeable legal framework and contain a series of strict safeguards. And what we're seeing in the in the UK is that while there is, whilst there is a legal framework for covert social media intelligence, so instances where fake profiles are created, or when someone pretends to be your friend on Facebook to access your information. However, when it comes to information that is publicly available, available, there is this Wild West approach when there is no, reg no regulations, no insufficient guidance. And finally, most recently, what we've also seen uh, this summer is that uh, local authorities are increasingly relying on social media information to assess age of young asylum seekers coming to the UK when their age is in dispute. And we've sent out again freedom of information requests to local authorities. We're still in the process of receiving all of the information, but already we are seeing that local authorities are using two techniques. Uh, to in help them assessing age of young asylum seekers. They can either review information from their social media that is publicly available, or they make requests to these young asylum seekers for provision of their login details and their passwords or to their social media profiles, which enables them to take all of the data, all of the Facebook history that is available to the user, as well as uh, data from messaging apps, such as WhatsApp and Messenger. Uh, and similarly to our research in 2019, we again found that there is no guidance, there is no policy, and there is no training being provided to local authorities who are relying on social media data to assess age of young asylum seekers. Moreover, when the data is collected or the data is viewed, an appropriate adult or a solicitor is not always present uh, with, the, with the young person. Uh, they have claimed that it is not a situation where they would need support. However, we've been in touch with some of the lawyers representing these young asylum seekers, and we've been told of situations where a, a, an asylum seeker may not have wished to provide all of their data on WhatsApp 
because they had some sent some private sexual images to their partners. And at the time, they didn't have anybody there with them to actually explain this to the local authorities. And they didn't have any, they didn't have any legal advice at the time either. So um, also, again, no records are being held about how many younger people's Facebook and social media data has actually been accessed for this purpose. And whilst the Home Office does have some policies with respect to age assessments, they do not contain any information or guidance about using information from Facebook or social media for this purpose. And um, this raises a number of problems because there's a complete abscess, absence of uh, consultation, of independent oversight and transparency. Further, there is a lack of understanding of social media in general, of how it is used by users, and particularly how it is used by young people. Because we can understand that many young people may wish to present themselves on social me media to appear older or to appear cooler or to appear more mature. And this raises significant red flags from any uh, inferences that are made with respect to social media data. Uh, as another example, uh, one of the lawyers we've been in touch with has also told us that one young asylum seeker uh, was actually accused of lying on uh, his uh, asylum application because in the asylum application, he has said that um, he doesn't have any brothers or sisters. Yet what they found from scrolling through his Facebook profile is that actually to, he responded as thanks bro to about 50 comments in his Facebook which was then used to insinuate that he must have been lying about having siblings. And of course, the impact of this is very significant because if you are deemed to have been lying in one area of your asylum application, the inference can further be made that you have probably also lied about your age. So we believe that this, the process of so using social media intelligence is extremely invasive, highly unreliable and disproportionate. And the fact that there is no internal audit uh, raises the question about how, the, how local authorities can judge whether it's actually effective in, in, in practice. And so to, just to sum up, um, we've had concerns surrounding the use of Sockment, either by local authorities or by um, law enforcement agencies, ultimately because this practice weaponizes the devices and the platform that we use every day. And as has been said previously, it enables groups of users to be targeted and, pro in, and profiled. And in particular, those groups that are already particularly at risks, such as women, LGBT people, journalists, human rights defenders, or asylum seekers. And we believe that the use of social media intelligence can pose a serious threat to privacy and other fundamental rights and freedoms, such as freedom of expression or a peaceful assembly, therefore threatening the very existence of modern democracies. And in addition, it also undermines the delivery of justice because justice is dependent on the integrity and accuracy of evidence, which social media intelligence often fails to provide. So that's it from me, and I look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you very much, Ksenia. Uh, very, very interesting examples. And again, it poses the same questions that previous uh, panelists said, right? There are, there is very difficult in many cases to, to distinguish between open OSINT and those that are not, such as uh, chat messenger messaging apps, or even what you said, uh, when the, the authority uh, gets access to the social network itself, then it goes into a, a part of the, of the platform that is not available for everyone. And yeah, those are the kind of, of problems that are now arising from the use of all teams by authorities. Um, I would like to know, Eduardo, if there is any question from the audience or if in the chat people would like to present any question uh, for the panel. 
Does anyone? Uh, so we have a few on-site participants. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has a question that wants to be raised to some of the panelists. I don't have access to I the Zoom. Uh, I think you have that. Okay. Yeah, I have one on, on Zoom. Uh, Ketenia, uh, please, can you repeat the name of the ECHR case in which PI intervened? intervened? Yes. And, it, the, and, the, it, and the situation, the process is right now, please. Yes. Uh, so the case is Salman Butt, Butt versus the United Kingdom, and I will write it in the chat as well, so it's visible. And the application was made uh, last year. And so we are waiting whilst the court currently is considering the application. So unfortunately, we don't yet know the date of the hearing and we don't yet know the outcomes of the court's uh, consideration. But it I will be for sure a first uh, position of a court on this topic. So it will be really interesting to follow up. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question. Please go ahead. Agustina. Um, can you do it? If you if you can talk, that would be perfect. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this interesting presentations. So we've been thinking a little bit about OSINT from Sele. And um, the question that I have for you is, Caro posted a number of different potential uses for OSINT. So if you have a judicial order, then maybe OSINT should have certain guidelines. Should we be thinking about guidelines or rules for OSINT according to the different purposes that we want to use it for? Should we be thinking about different rules per subject who's using them? So some rules for the private sector, other rules for the public sector. Should we be, how do we categorize? How do we think about frameworks that can be helpful to set the limits that we need to set and to account for the permissions that we need to account for. Thank you very much, Agustina. Um, who wants to start? Eduardo, go ahead, Eduardo, please. No, it's, it's, it's a comment. I'm not sure if I'm going to answer the question, but uh, let me, let me uh, raise the one case in Argentina and for uh, full disclosure I was the data protection authority in Argentina at the time when the Ministry of Security proposed some sort of protocol for what we call a cyber surveillance and the protocol was exactly a, a protocol for the um, um, police and other law enforcement uh, um, offices uh, that allowed them to uh, collect information from open sources, particularly from social media, to prevent some crimes. Um, and in that case, we opposed, uh, the Argentinian Data Protection Authority opposed uh, the, the protocol because it was too vague. Uh, it was not clear uh, who is going to gather the information uh, and, and particularly when the information collected is information that include personal data, uh, who is going to have access to that information, uh, for how long they are going to, to storage the information, and all of the principles that govern the protection of personal data were not included in the protocol. So I am saying that because this was, in my view, and probably are other uh, cases in other countries as well, in my view was a clear example in which trying to, uh, let's put it this way, legalize OSINT practices, uh, mm, it's, uh, it, 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 will, it, it would be uh, important to, to, to do so under my perspective, 
in different sectors. I mean, it's not the same when the law enforcement uh, uh, offices and law enforcement uh, people use or seen for the objectives or when a, a researcher in a university is doing OSINT for an academic purpose. So I think that both are OSINT practices, both are OSINT practices, unless we define OSINT in a different way, but the regulation or the limits, and there are ethical limits and there could be also legal uh, um, limits are different in my view. Thank you, Eduardo. I don't know if Dave or Kisinia had thought about it. What kind of recommendations can we uh, present for regulation? Or I interrupt you for a second. There's a question from the audience, so uh, we can also. Okay, let's do that and one, the... and I add one yeah. because we have ten minutes left. So ah, okay. So it's important. Then. Um. So sorry, Senia, <laughs> and um, David. So go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm Jamal from Topia, working in the information security area. Uh, concerning the ethical and legal boundaries, uh, especially in Africa, uh, most legal bodies for law enforcement are not aware of the uh, digital and OSINT uh, or uh, open source intelligence uh, knowledge. What is your recommendation in case of uh, uh, intersection of technology and human rights? Because uh, the academians are providing only cyber security uh, and information security uh, uh, background, but still uh, the legal bodies are following the traditional law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so I would pose the other question. There are two questions on the chat and then you can choose and, and we can, uh, so we keep the time. And um, there is, we should, we, wait, where we, where should we all as internet users stand before the possible risks that a scene could have on our fundamental rights? Should we change the way we use social media today? That's another question. And the last question is, what could be the ethical limits of OSINT and how can we control them from, cities, from the citizenship? Shouldn't there be limits? Shouldn't the limits be legal? Sorry. Um, so Dave or Kisinia, who would like to take I can, opportunity? Dave, I can take ahead. one of these questions. Um, so I'll go look at this question about where should we stand about the possible risks that OSINT could have on our fundamental rights and should we change we use the way we use social media? Uh, I'm always reluctant to encourage people to self-censor because uh, I, I, I do want to empower people to express themselves and to do reporting, to do activism online. But that said, it, we do have to face the reality that uh, we no longer live in a world where you can post something and only your friends really are paying attention to it and that it just disappears into obscurity. Um, you know, in a few weeks. We're in a time where it is being mined and scraped and the things that you post could have ramifications down the road. Um, one of the things that I find amusing in my work is that while there's all sorts of government secrets around surveillance technology, I can just go onto LinkedIn and find exactly what I want to know by looking at military contractors and police contractors LinkedIn pages where they say what all their experiences and all the things they're good at doing on particular technologies that they probably shouldn't be putting out into the world. Um, so I do I do recommend that people do think about what they post online and how it could be used. And uh, particularly when they're attending protests and deciding whether they're going to be posting photos of everyone at the protest with their faces or choosing to post a photo of people from behind or seeking consent before posting photos. That's not to say that I don't think journalists should do their jobs. I think they absolutely should. But I do think that there is a risk of sentiment you should be doing with social media and maybe not, you know, posting things unfiltered all the time because you don't necessarily know how it's going to be used against you or your friends later. Thank you very much, Dave. Kisinia? 
Hi. Uh, yes, I'll come in and I'll just sort of pick up on a couple of these questions. I'm also against um, self-censorship because this goes completely against our rights to freedom of expression. And considering the ludicrous inferences that can be made of uh, by governmental agencies, you know, when if a, if you respond to a comment saying thanks, bro, and this means that you have siblings, you cannot ultimately predict how the data that you post um, will will be used because it can be interpreted in so many different ways. And so I think the burden should not be on us, on the users, to self-censor, but because we shouldn't be treated as, you know, as uh, potential suspects in the first place. Uh, but I do agree that especially when about regarding attending protests, uh, perhaps for images and photographs um, should be posted with care. And uh, regarding regulations, it's always, it's always a tricky um tricky issue uh one thing that i can say from my perspective is that we do need stronger regulations for open source intelligence because uh law enforcement and um public authorities should not be going on fishing expeditions and taking all of the extent extensive highly sensitive and personal data from uh, social media it, it's uh, the approach needs to be much more targeted to a specific in, in situation to a specific users we certainly need stronger audit um, processes in place we need uh, people to be able to re ha seek redress when a decision has been made for instance as i've said if local authorities can't even tell us how many people's profiles they've visited and whose decision it's been impacted how do people challenge their completely bizarre inferences so uh, definitely stronger regulations need to be in place for both companies and um public authorities using it. And I think there was the last question about um, uh, not much information being available on uh, open source intelligence from the audience. And I certainly think that it's something that um, civil societies, academics uh, need to invest more um, time and uh, funding into research on open source intelligence because um whereas covert and sort of technologies um do have some regulations this is an area that seems to be like a pandora's box and see and many uh, public authorities adopt this wild west approach which is completely kind of unacceptable to us as a society thank you very much Ksenia. i think we are approaching very fastly the top of our hour so i would just uh, call in to any of you that would like to do some uh, closing remarks one minute each um i don't know eduardo do you want to do your one minute closing remark yes it's, i mean i it's, it's not much of what i already said i mean I, there is a very important link uh, in my view uh, when you are, uh, you know, referring to OSINT practices with uh, data protection regulations and the consent that we as data subjects uh, provide when we are using platforms. So this is this is diff is very difficult, um, and this is something that we of course need to work more. But we are working on the in on that uh, area in the field of, of data protection. This is one thing. The other thing is uh, I, I agree on that in the cases in which uh, law enforcement agencies use OSINT practices need to be more uh, regulated and oversighted. I mean, this is, this is for me very, very clear. Uh, because the risk uh, to you know use obscene practices in ways that nobody will admit in the analogic world uh, is is very high. Uh, but and I finish with this, uh, I'm I, I'm not in very favor to advocate for obscene practices regulation in general. 
because that could affect the OSINT practices that are not linked with uh, law enforcement activities and that could affect other sectors of the society like researchers that could be limited in using OSINT practices if we start doing regulations that could also affect that kind of practices. Thank you very much, Eduardo Quisinia. Do you want to do your closing remarks? One um, thank you. Uh, yes, so I, I just want to say that I think just as we have privacy in in public spaces offline, we need to ensure, make sure that our privacy in uh, online public spaces is also secure. And I think that consent is uh, certainly uh, problematic because just because I consent to posting pictures for my friends and family to see doesn't mean that I consent to um, law enforcement uh, reviewing those images or a company like Clearview scraping those images for a massive database. So con consent is always context specific. And even with uh, young asylum seekers, even though they may have consented to give log login details to uh, local authorities and their passwords, that doesn't mean that their consent was really truly informed and freely given, especially considering the inherent power imbalance between a young and vulnerable asylum seeker and law enforcement and public authorities. So this is definitely something that we should also bear in mind when we're considering either open source intelligence or social media uh, monitoring in general. Thank you. Thank you, Ketinia. Dave, you are, you started, you're finishing. Sure. Um, so when it comes to, to regulating issues related to social media monitoring, one of the measures that we have supported in the United States is this idea of um, uh, local rules called community control over police surveillance. So when law enforcement wants to acquire a technology tool, such as any, any of these forms of software that are mining the internet, helping them analyze uh, social media and other forms of OSINT, that they have to go through a process where they write a policy, they do a privacy impact and civil rights assessment, they submit that to a governing body, an elected body that has to have public hearings and solicit public input before approving or rejecting uh, the acquisition of that technology. And that's something that would apply to social media monitoring technology, um, whether that's just straight up observing or using that to predict uh, uh, crimes or, um, you know, other elements. So I would say that, that at least one practical thing that we've been working on already is these sort of like local governance measures. Thank you very much, Dave. I believe also it is very important to find out what the, the companies are offering to authorities, right? What are the capacities they are building up? and and then we can match it with, with what are the uses. This is also something that Charisma is working on and we might be talking about this further later. Thank you very much to all of you that were today with us. Thanks a lot for Sele for being the host of this uh, wonderful panel and, and all the help from Eduardo from Tedic who was there in Ethiopia and uh, allowing us to be in your computers. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for all the participants Bye. here as well. Bye.